Anyway, uh, the, yesterday I, I gave you two talks on the, um, the history and progress that we're making with uh, assessing gene function for every gene in the mouse genome. And, uh, of, of course, this course is a mixture of the general and the specific, how we use mouse genetics to understand new features of the mammalian genome landscape. Uh, and uh, to move towards our ultimate goal of understanding something about every gene in, in the mouse genome. And today I'm going to switch attention to an area of particular interest to myself, which I mentioned to you yesterday, and we had some discussion about it, and that's the genetics of deafness. Uh, but in particular, the use of mouse models and mouse mutants that, uh, in relationship to this uh, disease here, otitis media, that many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with, either in direct experience, because you suffered from it when you were a child, or you have children uh, who suffer from chronic otitis media and uh, uh, glue ear. And what I want to demonstrate to you today is the insight that we've got into this disease, into the molecular basis, the inflammatory pathways involved, that uh, allow us to understand what is the underlying pathological mechanism and of course, having understood the underlying pathological mechanism, we can then move to treatment. And I'll give you some idea today of the treatments that we've been testing in mice, hasn't moved to human yet, uh, that potentially uh, will form a new route, a new therapeutic route, uh, for treating uh, children in a non-invasive way for this uh, quite serious, uh, but I think uh, neglected uh, disease. So let me just tell you a bit about chronic otitis media or otitis media with effusion, sometimes known uh, as glue ear. Uh, most children, if not all, so probably all children, will, uh, by the age of five, have some period when they've had otitis media with effusion where their middle ears are full of fluid, they have difficulty hearing. Usually it's short-lived, uh, usually it's not treated, and it will disappear of its own uh, accord. Uh, but uh, many kids will go on to develop a chronic condition of this, which many of you will know as, as glue ear, where it doesn't, it doesn't resolve. Uh, and that condition of glue ear, it's the most common cause of hearing loss in the world. It will only affect these children uh, as kids. They will gradually grow out of it, and they won't see any uh, middle ear effusion or glue ear uh, when they're older. But for those kids who have this chronic condition of otitis media with infusion, the only treatment that's available is inserting grommets uh, into the tympanic membrane, ostensibly to, to relieve fluid and pressure, but actually nobody really understands how they work. They seem to work reasonably well. So it's the most common surgical operation in children in the developed world. Much more common than any other surgical operation <coughs> And you can see the kind of health care costs that we see in the US. But this operation of inserting grommets is often ineffective. They often fall out. Children have to go recurrent rounds of surgery to replace the grommets. Uh, and they don't always work. So it's a very common disease. We have a rather poor treatment for it. But we also know that for chronic otitis media, as opposed to acute otitis media that develops from an infection in the middle ear, for this chronic otitis media, genetic factors play a major role. But until we started working on mouse models, there were no genes known. None of the underlying predisposing genetic factors uh, were known. And although there had been some human studies done, mainly to look at heritability of chronic otitis media, uh, human genetics had failed to uh, identify any uh, clear loci that were involved in predisposing children to the development of this chronic disease. So over the years, go, going back over 10 years now, as we've assessed mouse mutants coming through our mutagenesis pipelines for uh, uh, deafness, for hearing loss, we've been on the lookout not for uh, mouse, well, both for mouse mutants that have sensor neural hearing loss, where there's something wrong with the auditory mechanism, but also for mice that have got poor hearing, because like these kids, their middle ears are full of pus and glue, they have a genetically predisposed otitis media. And in fact, we found a number of these mutants, and I'm going to tell you a bit about them today. And this is the first one. The first one we found, in fact, we published it way back in 2003. It's called Jeff. 
Well, not, don't ask me why it's called Jeff, but it's called Jeff. And it's a single gene model for otitis media. It came out of our ENU mutagenesis program. It's a highly penetrant, it's a dominant mutation. In fact, it's uh, embryonic lethal as a homozygote. And it shows a hearing loss. And that hearing loss is a conductive deafness. And it's due to the development of a chronic serous otitis media. In the middle ears of these mice, the middle ear, as you can see here, here's the wild type middle ear, here's the tympanic membrane. The middle ear here is full of pus uh, and fluid. And actually that prevents the mice from hearing so well. We can pick this up in our auditory uh, measurements that I was talking about yesterday. You can see the mouse here uh, is distinguishable from the wild type simply in terms of body size. It's slightly, slightly smaller. And in fact, I won't go into this, but its craniofacium is, is slightly altered as well. So this turned out to be a mutation in a gene called um, uh, FBOX11. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I'm not going to tell you much about uh, this gene in, in detail, partly for, for reasons of time, but suffice to say that FBOX genes are genes that are responsible for protein turnover. They bring uh, specific proteins to E3 ubiquitin ligase complexes for ubiquitination and protein turnover. And the Jeff mutation here was this non-conservative glutamine to leucine change in this part of the gene here. Here's the FBOX motif that is responsible for binding this protein to the E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. We in fact found another mutation in this gene which is called MUT, uh, and, uh, but I, I'm not going to tell you much about that particular gene. So um, we found another model as well as we moved along. Uh, also from our ENU mutagenesis program. And uh, this model, in fact, is called Jumbo. This, this uh, was identified by a, a Taiwanese student in uh, uh, the, the lab. And Jumbo, in fact, is the Taiwanese word for deaf. Uh, and um, it's identified from, as I said, from our ENU mutagenesis program. It's also highly penetrant mutant showing hearing loss. There's no sensory neural hearing loss in this mutant. I should have emphasized that that's true for Jeff as well. <laughs> And this also displays a conductive deafness due to the development of a chronic suppurative OM. You can see here in the middle ear, it's full of pus and fluid that's preventing these mice from hearing very well. So this was another uh, mutant uh, of a Titus medium, again published way back in uh, 2006. And this turns out to be a mutation in quite a well-known transcription factor uh, called EVI1. It's an asparagine to isoleucine change in the second zinc finger region of this transcription factor that's involved with uh, DNA binding, and it alters uh, uh, this highly conserved amino acid in, in, the, in the protein. So <clears throat> I'm going to summarize quite a lot of work here by um, saying that both of these mutations and when we found them, piqued our interest enormously because they both feed into uh, the same signaling pathway. So this, is, uh, this diagram summarizes quite a lot of work in looking at these two proteins, both FBOX11 and EVI1. Let me start with EVI1. EVI1 was, as I said, a transcription factor which is already fairly well uh, characterized, and it's a co-transcriptional repressor of SMAD3, which is uh, an important component of the TGF beta signaling pathway. FBOX11 uh, also impacts upon TGF beta signaling, but via a variety of routes, probably via ubiquitination of uh, factors that interact with the TGF beta signaling pathway, but certainly via P53. FBOX11 through nedulation of P53 is a repressor of P53, and P53 has extensive crosstalk, particularly through SMAD2 and P53 SMAD2 interactions with TGF beta signaling. And why is TGF beta signaling, and why, why did that immediately set alarm bells uh, going in our head about what the role of these particular genes and mutations might be in developing chronic otitis media? Because TGF beta signaling itself crosstalks with another pathway, and that's the hypoxia pathway, <coughs> the pathway that is elicited when any particular tissue or organ or fluid space uh, is hypoxic. Uh, when uh, uh, we have hypoxia in a particular tissue, we elicit, uh, elicit a transcriptional 
uh, network, a transcriptional program, uh, through the primary transcription factor, uh, HIF1 alpha. It's a very well-known pathway. So let me just expand upon that to give you a flavor of where our hypothesis led from uh, this particular discovery of where these genes might be acting in a particular pathway. So what's the potential relationship between hypoxia and, e and, and otitis media? Well, there is an interplay between TGF beta signaling and hypoxia signaling pathways. And we surpart, sur surmised, although it wasn't really known, that that middle ear fluid space full of pus and glue is going to be a hypoxic environment where oxygen is going to be in short supply. You all know that the middle ear is a poorly ventilated space. Every time you go up in a, an aeroplane, you can feel the effects that, uh, that you don't get enough oxygen into that ventilated space because you can feel the pressure on your uh, tympanic membrane. Uh, when you have a cold, your middle ears are full of fluid. It's the same as having chronic otitis media. You, you know that your hearing is affected. But also, there's less oxygen getting to the epithelial surfaces. Uh, if you have a pus-filled uh, fluid cavity as well, all those cells are requiring oxygen. So there's a, it's likely that that fluid-filled cav cavity is going to be highly hypoxic. And we surmise that the dysregulation of TGF beta signaling in Jumbo and Jeff impairs the hypoxic response that we see in the middle ear that's normally elicited when any fluid filled space or any space in an organ or whatever doesn't get enough oxygen and becomes hypoxic. So the first question to ask was in our mutants, does the middle ear look hypoxic? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, we can use a compound called PIMO, which labels uh, both hypoxic epithelia and cells. Here's the jumbo mice. You can see the brand labeling of uh, PIMO. This actually increases as the jumbo mice develop chronic otitis media between four and, and eight weeks. You can see the, uh, the wild type here. You can see the negative control. The wild type, uh, the, the middle ear... Uh, uh, Epithelium is not inflamed, unlike the, the jumbo, is highly inflamed, full of fibroblasts here. You can see the macrophages in the pus-filled pus exudate in the middle ear cavity. And all of this is highly hypoxic. These cells are under stress, and they're going to be eliciting a hypoxic response through the HIF1-alpha transcription factor that I just mentioned. And the question is, is this mutant in Jumbo, which is imp impacting on the TGF beta signaling pathway in the crosstalk to uh, hypoxia, uh, compromising the hypoxic response so that what happens is, as I'll come on to tell you, we get runaway inflammation that's poorly controlled and ultimately we get a chronic otitis media. So I just want to remind you of that, uh, those hypotheses again, that we're dealing with uh, the disruption of an interplay between TGF beta signaling and hypoxia signaling pathways. We for sure have uh, hypoxia developing in the middle ear cavity in these mice, and we surmise that dysregulation of TGF beta signaling in these two mutants is impairing the response of the middle ear uh, to hypoxic conditions. And we get runaway uh, res hypoxic responses which lead to this chronic inflammatory, inappropriate chronic inflammatory state uh, in the middle ear in these mice. So let me just walk you through that, how it might actually work in terms of a molecular model of the pathways involved. This is rather simplistic, but it gives you a good idea of, of how the pathways crosstalk between TGF beta and hypoxia and how a mutation might disrupt that crosstalk. So remember, TGF beta signaling, SMAD3, activated phosphorylated SMAD3 is a, com a key component of TGF beta signaling. EBI1 is a co-repressor of SMAD3, so if we knock down EBI1, SMAD3 goes up. But SMAD3 is also a repressor of this enzyme here, pro prolyl hydroxylase 2, which in fact uh, is responsible for hydroxylation of HIF1 alpha, which activates the response to hypoxia and keeps the cell in a normoxic state. But if uh, SMAD3 is now going up, PHD2 is going down, we're transferring from a normoxic response to a hypoxic response, HIF1-alpha goes up, SMAD3 is going up, and together they're going to drive downstream pathways, which are part of the HIF1-alpha and hypoxia response, 
including upregulation of this key molecule here, VEGF. And VEGF leads to angiogenesis, vascular leak, all the kind of things that we'd expect to see in a chronically inflamed middle ear. Epithelial uh, uh, thickening and uh, additional blood vessels for forming, vascular leak, exudate into the middle ear and so on. So this is our hypothesis of how the pathways are working and how uh, if we impinge upon those pathways with a mutation here, the jumbo mutation in EVI1, uh, changes to SMAD3, SMAD3's interaction with the normoxic hypoxic pathway, acting synergistically to upregulate VEGF, leading to angiogenesis, vascular leak, an uncontrolled hypoxic response, which ultimately leads to fluid uh, and uh, 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 angiogenesis and actually lymphangiogenesis, a, cro a chronic inflammatory state and exudate in, in the middle ear. So the question is if if that is our model, how can we show that it's correct? We went on to do a whole number of experiments uh, that looks at both what does the exudate look like, <coughs> does it reflect the kind of pathways that we think are being per per perturbed. So first of all, we looked at uh, what genes are being tr transcribed uh, in both the epithelium and exudate in the hip responsive pathways. We looked at a whole series of genes. I, I, I won't dwell for, for the two mutations, I won't dwell on the individual data, but su suffice to say that HIF and, their, and its target genes, such as GLUT1 and VEGF uh, alpha, are significantly elevated, along not unexpectedly with cytokines, inflammatory cytokines like IL1 beta and TNF alpha. And indeed, if we look at the protein in the middle ear, so I just want you to focus on here's, um, uh, these are, we, obviously for middle ear exudates we don't have a control. If you have a normal middle ear there's no exudate in it there, so we test serum uh, as the baseline control for uh, levels of this case, VEGF protein, we're looking at VEGF protein in this slide. Here are the levels in serum. Here are the levels in um, uh, jumbo ear fluid. Uh, and this is, remember, this is a log scale, so this is highly significant increases in the amount of VEGF protein in the middle ear, again, supporting the pathway and mechanism that we think is operating in the middle ear. Uh, and here's Jeff as well. You can see in Jeff there are highly raised levels of um, uh, VEGF in, in these animals. So from all the evidence we have, VEGF receptor pathway genes uh, would be, if VEGF's regulated, what's happening to VEGF pathway genes? Are they upregulated in Jeff and Jumbo mice? That impact on, on these areas such as uh, cell proliferation, angiogenesis, vascular leak, and so on. And the answer is, is yes as, as well. Look at many of these genes downstream of VEGF. Uh, uh, um, these are all the genes in red that are upregulated. Uh, they, they all are impacted by changes in these mutants in HIP1 signaling, downstream of that VEGF, and uh, subsequent pathway changes, all of which are likely to lead to the uh, uh, inflammation and exudate that we see in uh, chronic otitis media. So our model uh, for otitis media is this. This is the normoxic uh, well-ventilated middle ear epithelium here, the underlying bone, the mucosa. But what's happening in the hypoxic environment, the uncontrolled hypoxic environment in these mutations where we're not getting resolution, is that we probably end up getting a, a, a cycle of VEGF signaling, inflammation, fluid, inflammatory cells, increased hypoxia, which is never inappropriately result, it's never appropriately resolved because of the mutations uh, in, in Jeff and Jumbo that are impacting on this uh, signaling between the TGF beta pathway and the hypoxic pathway. Uh, uh, so the question is, can we break this cycle of chronic inappropriate inflammation? Can we introduce molecules into the middle ear that one will break this cycle and dampen, dampen down the inflammation and vascular leak? And two, if we can do that, that probably confirms our model of, of how the chronic otitis media is, is developing in these mice. And indeed, uh, this, this model and these pathways do provide us with a new target. It's here because, of course, um, 
Uh, if we think uh, most of the inflammation is arising from signaling through, through VEGF, VEGF receptors uh, have been a big target for uh, cancer uh, o over the years, and there are a number of compounds freely available uh, which uh, can interrupt this particular pathway, such as vitalinib, serefinib, sunitinib, all acting on VEGF receptors and potentially able if delivered to the middle ear of these mice to uh, uh, counter the angiogenesis, the vascular permeability and vascular leak that we see developing in these mice that lead to the chronic otitis media. <clears throat> so each of, these, um, each of these compounds will act on the VEGF receptors. There are a whole class of anti-cancer drugs. They're anti-angiogenic, anti anti-lymphangiogenic, uh, and our aim was to see, could they be used, obviously delivered, in, in this case, to the mice systemically, as opposed to directly to the middle ear, could they be used to dampen down the chronic inflammatory response? One, providing a, a, a potential new therapy, and two, um, uh, providing further confirmatory evidence that these are the pathways and mechanisms <coughs> that are involved with uh, developing chronic otitis media in these mice. It's worth pointing out also that we could use... Um, drugs that actually impact upon the uh, HIF-1 signaling pathway itself, the hypoxia signaling pathway. There is this compound here, 17 DMAG. It inhibits uh, this heat shock protein, HSP90, which is a chaperone for, H, uh, for a HIF-1-alpha, and destabilizes HIF. So this was another potential drug that we uh, threw into the mix. And the, 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 the experiment was, was relatively simple. Jumbo and Jeff Mice, they develop this chronic otitis media about four weeks of, of age. It develops between about 28 days and 56 days. And uh, we, uh, at 28 days, we took our mutant or wild-type mice and we administered these compounds to them systemically. I'll come back to this later on. Obviously, this is su isn't something that you want to do with kids. You're probably all thinking this. We don't want to be giving them anti-cancer drugs systemically. But I'll come back to that point later on. But suffice to say that for our experiments in, in mice, this was a straightforward way to go initially. So we wanted to administer these drugs systemically to our, our mutant mice, and then ask the question, once they've been administered, how did their hearing develop between 28 days and 56 days? Because during that time, the chronic otitis media is developing. Their uh, uh, auditory thresholds are deteriorating. They're obviously getting a, a major inflammation in the middle ear. They're, they're uh, producing exudate into the middle ear space. We wanted to measure all these things. We wanted to look at what we call the delta ABR. Remember that test that I mentioned to you yesterday, the auditory brainstem response, uh, which involves testing the auditory thresholds of a mice. What we wanted to see was if we ad administered drugs systemically to the mice, could we, uh, could we prevent the deterioration in auditory thresholds? In other words, could we measure the delta ABR? We'd like to get the de delta ABR to naught, that there's no change in hearing loss during that period. Obviously, by the time the mice have got to 28 days, they've already developed some chronic otitis media, so there is going to be some hearing loss. We wanted to see, could we prevent any further hearing loss, and could we ameliorate the histopathological changes that we see in the middle ear uh, as the chronic otitis media develops? So this slide um, shows you the nub of the, the data. I'll just walk you through it. So VEGF receptors inhibitors indeed moderate hearing loss. And here are the compounds that I mentioned before that we tested. Vitalinib we tested in, in two, uh, uh, in, in two uh, doses, two, two different uh, dosage states. And uh, we have in each uh, panel, we have the wild type. Uh, we have um, uh, sham, so the, uh, uh, the, these are mice that are clearly going to, we'd expect, through the delivery of uh, a sham dose, uh, we'd expect their uh, ABR thresholds to be deteriorating. And then in blue, those are the ones really to look at. This is where we're delivering the drugs and we want to look at the delta ABR. So I'll just put a, a line down here. Um, those, the blue ones are the ones we want to look at, and there's a line there which, coming up, uh, which uh, is the uh, delta ABR of naught. And you can see that very effectively in these mice, compared to the, uh, the, the sham animals, 
uh, we see uh, quite significant reductions, often uh, uh, keeping the, the deterioration uh, of hearing in these mice effectively at zero. So there's no further deterioration in, in auditory thresholds. So this, this for us was, was quite impressive. We're basically stopping the deterioration of the chronic otitis media in its tracks in terms of auditory thresholds. And we've done some subsequent work, which I'll, I'll mention a bit later on, uh, with a, a other compounds where, in fact, in some cases, although there's evidence of that here, where we see an improvement uh, in auditory uh, threshold. But the other thing that we obviously wanted to look for in terms of delivering these drugs was improvements in uh, the, the mucosal changes in inflammation that you, you see in these mice. So here's a wild-type mouse at 56 <coughs> days. You can see this nice, clean, thin mucosa, no evidence of inflammatory disease at all. Here's a jumbo mouse at 56 days. Look at, look at this inflammation here. Here's the exudate in the, in the middle ear. These uh, 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 polyps that are projecting into the middle ear cavity that are, are very indicative of uh, extraordinary inflammation in the middle ear, along with the associated... Uh, uh, angiogenesis and lymphangiogenesis that you see in the, um, uh, the inflamed mid middle ear lining. And the VEGF receptor inhibitors, they improve uh, a variety of indicators of the, uh, the pathology. I'm just showing you one bit of data for this compound, Vitalinib. And you can see that uh, both in terms of uh, counting blood vessels, angiogenesis, uh, and also in terms of uh, lymphangiogenesis, you can see marked improvements uh, here uh, with respect to the, um, uh, the, the, the sham controls, uh, indicating that the drug is, is doing its job uh, in, the, in terms of the, uh, pathologi the pathology that's developing as well. And the other thing that we can notice is that if you compare a drug uh, with uh, sham uh, mice, uh, uh, where we looked at the amount of fluid uh, in the middle ear. We obviously can't look at, there's no fluid at all in the wild types. But no fluid's blue, fluid is red. And you can see the significant improvements in the drug-treated mice in the amount of fluid that we see in the middle ear, which of course uh, uh, um, ties in with the uh, improvement in auditory thresholds that we see in these mice as well. So... Uh, to, to summarize, we have a variety of opportunities here uh, to use um, VEGF receptor inhibitors to target the VEGF signaling pathways as potential new therapeutic routes for otitis media. Uh, we've obviously used these three compounds here. Uh, we also see effects using the, uh, the, the, the DMAG compound that, that, that I talked about. But principally, we focused on uh, VEGF receptor inhibitors and their role in uh, uh, influencing these pathways, moderating hearing loss, reducing fluid, and reducing the formation of uh, uh, new blood vessels. We've, uh, we've done some more work um, uh, that I, I can't really tell you about because it's, it's private. I, we teamed up with AstraZeneca, who have a whole slate of VEGF receptor inhibitors. We looked at some additional ones, including a SARC kinase inhibitor, which actually didn't work very well for reasons we don't uh, entirely understand. But we have a new <coughs> AZ uh, VEGF receptor kinase inhibitor that looked uh, to be even more efficacious than the drugs uh, that, we, uh, that I've, I've described here. And of course, uh, the, the future here in terms of medicating the ear is to look at a wider range of compounds to es establish the, first of all, the systemic efficacy of these drugs. But, uh, and I'm not going to talk very much about this, but simply to say that, of course, now that we have a potential route for uh, delivering compounds and, and a, a, a thinking about a different approach uh, to uh, treating chronic otitis media, the way forward in the future is to consider ototopical delivery of the drug directly through the tympanic membrane. And a lot of research is going on, not only at, at Harwell and elsewhere, but in, in many companies to try and solve this problem. One of the, one of the potential for middle ear treatment, not simply for chronic otitis media, but for acute infections in the middle ear, is to be able to get drugs directly to the middle ear, which of course is relatively accessible. The tympanic membrane is all that separates the uh, middle ear from the outer world. And the aim in chronic otitis media is to use the progress that we've made here 
to take the uh, treatment of the chronic disease out of the hands of ENT surgeons and, and, and into primary care. And the, the things that we're working on are looking at microneedle patches that we could put on the tympanic membrane of kids that both aerate the middle ear, because aeration will help. It's probably why grommets work. They're reducing the levels of hypoxia in the middle ear, but delivering compounds directly into the middle ear that will damp down the inflammation. And that, I think, is the future for the treatment of this disease, understanding the molecular pathology, but hand in hand with that, looking at novel mechanisms for ototopical delivery uh, uh, on the tympanic membrane in, into the middle ear. And that really is the next uh, hurdle that we need to climb of looking at the various mechanisms and route all the way from gels that you put on the tympanic membrane to uh, microneedle patches and, and so on. A, a straightforward, simple way uh, that you could either go to the ENT clinic, you get this patch put on, it will deliver uh, drugs over a long period directly to the middle ear uh, and directly <coughs> intervene in the, the pathways that are uh, uh, causing chronic otitis media and get away entirely from the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the extraordinary things that we do to kids now by putting them um, uh, into uh, general surgery and sticking grommets in their tympanic membranes, which uh, when you think about it, it's, it's a bit like sort of um, 17th century leeches and bleeding and things like that. So an example of a, a clinical treatment that we... we all know, uh, but uh, we've got really no idea why it works. Uh, one of the things I think is worth emphasizing, of course, you're going to be asking how, how relevant are the changes that we see in the mouse middle ear to what actually happens in, in kids molecularly. And in fact, we have, we have done a study here. We've taken samples from a lot, it's more than 18 children now, who've been undergoing grommet surgery for chronic flu ear, and we've looked at the middle ear fluids at the very for uh, changes in gene levels in the various pathways that uh, I've talked to you about. And for sure, as you can see here, if we look at the, the levels of these key proteins in both uh, HIF1 alpha and VEGF signaling pathways, uh, they're all raised as well. And the findings very much mirror the findings that we found in the mouse model. So we think the molecular pathways uh, that are involved in um, uh, otitis media are very, are, are in, in humans are very similar. So the future directions, and I'm sort of running a bit out of time, so I might curtail the, the other bit of my talk uh, and leave it here, is that we want to further elaborate the mechanisms of chronic otitis media. We, we obviously need to look at additional inhibitors, small molecules. This is very important, and I'll just mention this again at the end. We want to identify, characterize, and investigate additional mouse models of chronic otitis media. And we have several new mouse mutant models, and I'll come back to that later on. And we want to investigate the underlying molecular basis of human chronic otitis media. We want to do more, we want to build more on the Loom study. And of course, this is absolutely key to develop delivery systems for topical administration into the middle ear. I should point out that if we can do this, it, it has a, an enormous potential, not just for chronic otitis media, but the treatment of acute infections and also the potentially the delivery of vaccines to the middle ear to pre prevent uh, acute uh, otitis media, the pneumococcal and uh, NTHI infections, which are prevalent throughout the, uh, 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 the, the ch ch populations of children in all countries uh, across the world. Now, um, because it's coming up to 22, I'm just going to... I'm not, I had another bit to my talk, but just suffice to say that it doesn't end with Jumbo and Jeff. We have an, a number of other mutants that we've discovered, and this is a recent one. It's called Edison, uh, and um, again, it has features that are very like Jumbo and Jeff. And I, I'm not going to dwell on this. I've got a series of slides on it, but simply to... It, I put it in there to say, of course, we want more mouse models. We want to understand more about the potential pathways that probably all feed in ultimately to VEGF signaling uh, and uh, uh, chronic otitis media. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell on, on this. Uh, so what I'll do is simply run through the slides to um, say that, of course, in a, uh, this new MASH model, it looks almost identical to Jeff and Jumbo. Uh, 
the, the upregulation of VEGF, uh, in fact, uh, TNF alpha, IL1 beta, very comparable to, to Jeff and Jumbo. And in terms of its pathological features and the development of chronic otitis media, it's very similar too. But I just want to skip to the end to say that uh, it's, it's working through a slightly different pathway. Nisharin, in fact, is a repressor of these pathways here. I'm not going to go into any of this in detail, the RAC and PAC1 pathways, which also feed into NF-kappa-beta uh, and LIMK1. NF-kappa-beta, of course, is a key, key, a key inflammatory uh, modulator. And LIMK1 is, in fact, involved with uh, vascular leak and angiogenesis, as has been shown as well. So this is an example of a mutation that's not working through uh, starting off and working through perturbing this relationship between TGF beta signaling uh, and um, uh, the hypoxia pathways, but through a different route. But the end result is much the same. And the Edison mutant shows upregulation of phosphosmad 2 in the middle epithelium, upregulation of VEGF, TNF alpha, and IL 1 beta. So, probably the kind of uh, Targets and routes that we're, uh, we've been working out with Jeff and Jumble will work in this, this molecule as well, in this uh, mutant as well. So I'm not, not going to dwell too much on this, uh, but simply to come back to my conclusions, uh, overall conclusions, hypoxia and TGF beta signaling along with downstream effects on the VEGF pathway are key targets. VEGF receptor inhibitors represent a novel therapeutic avenue which might find new clinical application in the treatment of, of chronic OM. And the development, I think this is a key point, the development of chronic OM probably represents a matrix of potential perturbations on inflammatory pathways that impact downstream on common pathway outcomes, and particularly VEGF signaling and downstream from there. And elaborating that matrix in both mice and human will be critical for the identification and delivery of novel therapeutics. But I hope I've demonstrated to you today that I think without the mouse, we, we just wouldn't be here at all where we are in terms of a, a new understanding of what's happening with this chronic disease. And we wouldn't have this perception of how to move forward. I don't think we ever would have really got this insight simply by sampling uh, um, and looking at the molecular pathology in humans. And importantly, uh, the genetics that's been done in the human population uh, in terms of chronic otitis media uh, has been relatively, um, relatively unsuccessful. Uh, but of course, one thing I haven't gone into is that with these genes and pathways that we've identified in the mouse, we've now gone back into the human population and started doing association studies with large uh, cohorts of uh, families affected by chronic otitis media. With, with some considerable degree of success, some of these key molecules are associated in the human population, giving us further basis for thinking that this, 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 is, this is a route uh, where we can develop novel therapeutics and apply it generally for chronic otitis media uh, in humans. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.